I have always been fascinated by fire. <laughs> Maybe it had to do with growing up in the humid Florida heat, but from the age of five, I collected old birthday and Hanukkah candles. Keep going. Let me say that again. Maybe it had to do with growing up in the humid Florida heat, but from the age of five, I collected old birthday and Hanukkah candles and took books of matches and created melted statues from the wax. The wax, uh, the magic was not in the flame. That appreciation would come later. But my fascination was in the power of what the flame could do. I loved watching the wax slowly drip onto a piece of cardboard like beads of blood. A slow drip tower of blue and red and yellow plopped on top of one another until a sort of volcanic mountain formed. The fire was not the point, the heat, the destruction. None of that was important to me as I rationalized my sociopathic potential. <laughs> no, it, it was the creation of the structure, the co coagulation of the color into an abstract Jackson Pollock. Instead of paint, I, I dripped wax. First little dots, then lines of wax that intersected each other, some building into a clump, others delicately bridging one piece to another until it formed a geometric image like a spirograph. The jagged ridges creeped and crawled in every direction, forming a wax coral reef of white that glowed in the darkness like a star in the sky. I was exhilarated. I was calm. I was lost. I was complete. A, a pool of wax settled at the base of the candle that reflected the light of the flame, and I dipped my finger into the hot wax with a zinging sting, forming a perfect bowl around the tip of my finger that quickly cooled into a hard shell that I carefully peeled from my skin, revealing the ridges of my fingerprints. Holding it close to my eye, the translucent ridges held an intuitive connection to my DNA. I, of course, hid my obsession from my parents. I made sure that the wax drips only hit the little piece of white cardboard that I used as a self-contained base so that I could hide it away deep in my closet. The size and complexity of the sculpture depended on the size of the candles. Birthday candles were the first to dis disappear in my house. Then we never seemed to have Hanukkah candles during the holidays. The emergency candles also fell victim to my obsession, and they offered so much potential for my creative outlet. <laughs> the wax drips from these thick white candles were seemingly endless. When I touched the flame to the tip, I melted the bottom of a candle and stuck it firmly to a white square piece of cardboard, then lit the wick and watched the flame dance in the darkness as the small drops of wax slid down the shaft then froze suddenly, creating a shelf for the next random drop that accumulated towards the top, as if each drop yearned to reach back into the flame. I took my wax creation and placed it on a shelf in my closet with my other creations, each as unique and distinctive from each other as a snowflake. I was an only child growing up in, Flor in the Florida sun, a member of a generation that proudly declared a unique independence when students and kids roamed neighborhoods freely without supervision. When my parents thought I was spending too much time in the apartment, they kicked me out of my room and told me to play outside. My outside was a sprawling apartment complex in Tallahassee, Florida. When I was forced out of the apartment, I spent the hot Florida summer days at the complex playground across the street from a construction site with my best friend, Wesley. And the two of us spent our time on an old donated fire truck next to the playground. The long ladder truck was once painted with an old fashioned fire red, but the red had long faded into a dull berry color cracked and peeling its wooden ladders broken, the tires purposely flattened, but it was our playground. The dials, buttons, and levers were the foundation of our imagination. Apollo 11 had just landed on the moon, so Wesley and I pretended that the old beat-up fire truck was a spaceship, and we were astronauts making a lunar landing. We knew that there was no such thing as a steering wheel on the lunar lander, so 
Wesley maneuvered our ship using the fire truck pedals, and I, I guided the ship with a fire truck stick shift that stuck out between us. Landing in five, Wesley announced. Four, three, two, one. We both blew landing sound effects that sounded more like a broken ham radio. And finally, success. The eagle had landed. I looked to Wesley triumphantly, and, but Wesley was looking at the construction site across the street. Let's pretend that we just landed on the moon, Wesley announced with more energy than I expected. And we just found the lost city, and we need to explore to see if there's any aliens walking around. It sounded like a perfectly good plan. And I knew that I easily had another couple of hours before I was allowed back into the apartment, so I agreed, and off we went. The inside of the new apartment building was finished, aside from exposed wires, and of course there wasn't electricity or running water, or locked doors. We had the run of the place. I continued my role as an astronaut on the moon, look, moon looking for alien life, but Wesley had moved on. He disappeared into one of the downstairs apartments. I followed him, followed him into a back bedroom next to the heating unit and ran into Wesley, who was on one knee holding a stick into the flame of the furnace. With great excitement, Wesley pulled the stick from the furnace, and we both and we both observed in awe the flame that was now ignited at the end of the stick. In the stifling heat, we nurtured that little flame, blowing on it lightly until it took to the wood of the stick and flashed brilliantly. A string hung above our heads that was attached to a light bulb. Wesley held the flame to the cloth of the string, and in seconds, the string lit up like a fuse all the way to the light bulb that was suddenly engulfed in flames. At first, we stood mesmerized, watching the ball burn like a shooting star. But then suddenly, the bulb exploded, and the glass showered, showered over us in a haze of chalked glass, and we ran from the room. Still, we were not afraid. We didn't panic. We still had our flame stick, and we kept burning things, kept changing the way things looked. We pressed the flame against the newly painted wall in the living room. It was only a matter of seconds before the wall turned into a blue, ambered wall of flames that only burned the paint, not the wall itself, creating a blanket of flame that turned dark blue, then orange, and then after a few seconds, it, turned out com it, turned, it burned out completely, leaving charred streaks. I, I was never afraid that the flames would burn out of control. I I was too fascinated to be afraid. It looked so cool. I, I didn't want to run away. <laughs> we tried that several times. We went through the apartment looking for all the possible things that would burn with our fire stick. The plastic tubing of the air conditioning unit melted with pops and sparked. It, it was our own 4th of July, and we were the creators of the fireworks, the artists that found the colors and the sounds that went beyond my simple wax candle sculptures. We didn't realize that smoke had been seeping from the windows, <laughs> catching the attention of several construction workers who happened to be working on a Sunday. Wesley and I walked out carrying our fire stick, laughing and excited about our next adventure. Hey, we heard from behind us. We turned and saw two very large weeble-like men in overalls and yellow hard hats ambling towards us. One of the fluffy construction workers called out to us. Wesley and I turned and ran as fast as we could across the street into the front, into the front of Wesley's building. We then ran out the back of the building and separated. I ran towards the pool. I I'm pretty sure Wesley turned around and went back to his apartment. I circled toward the pool, ran around the building, and came face to face with two tall, non-fluffy police officers. <laughs> I turned to run when one of the officers screamed, stop! And I did. <laughs> I have no idea why I stopped. To this day, I cannot comprehend why I turned around and obeyed the command, but stop is exactly what I did. The two police officers, each holding an arm, marched me into my apartment to confront my parents. For this, I felt a little hopeful because there was a good chance my parents were not home. But when the officer knocked on the door, still holding my arm tightly, my heart sank. 
when our apartment door opened and my mother stood in the doorway looking confused and even a little scared. When the officers saw my mom, they both released me and I ran past my mother into my room, threw myself onto my bed. I heard my mother call out to my father. They said he almost burned down an apartment building. I wrapped myself in my Sesame Street blanket and hoped beyond hope that I would never be discovered. My father came into my room first. We're going to sell all of your toys, he announced, sweeping his arm from one end of the room to the next. With the uh, intended effect of encompassing all my toys in the room, he never explained exactly how he planned to sell all of my toys, but I suppose he was going to hold a toy-themed garage sale, the proceeds of which would go to the, to the repairing of the apartment. My father turned to my closet to take out the toys to be sold when he discovered my collection of wax sculptures. He reached in and pulled out a particularly nice colorful specimen that was made completely of melted blue birthday candles. My mother walked into the room in time to see my father with an armful of wax sculptures. And when he saw her, he dropped the sculptures to the floor like some sort of common trash. The fragile sculptures cracked and broke when they hit the floor. Their frozen wax drops sprayed into the air like fine mist. And I remember thinking how beautiful the wax mists looked when they were destroyed. <laughs> how interesting their remains seemed when they were collected on the floor, one on top of the other, like, like the thrashed remains of a trailer court after a tornado. I look back now and I remember the horrifying beauty of destruction in the, in the heart of a summer that was stifling and isolating. Wesley got away, and I never gave him up. I was a firm believer in loyalty, even at the innocent age of five. There was therapy, you can count on that, and all the old worries had to be revisited after I burned down a section of my middle school. But that is a story for another day. Ben Fearman, everybody.